Hello, the 19th century philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche wrote, There can be no doubt that morality will gradually perish. This is the great spectacle in a hundred acts reserved for the next two centuries in Europe. And with chilling predictions like this, nihilism sped on its way. The hard view that morals are pointless, loyalty is a weakness, and truths are illusory. It's excited, confused, and appalled Western thinkers ever since. But what happened to Nietzsche's revolutionary ideas about truth, morality, and a life without meaning? Existentialism can claim lineage to Nietzsche, as can postmodernism, but then so can Nazism. With so many interpretations and claims of ownership from the left and the right, has anything positive come out of the great philosopher of nothing? With me to discuss Nietzsche and nihilism are the philosopher Rob Hopkins from the University of Birmingham, Professor Raymond Tallis, doctor, philosopher and a critic of the postmodernists, and also with us is one of their staunch defenders, Professor Catherine Belsey from the University of Cardiff. Let's talk first about Nietzsche and the Enlightenment. Nietzsche, the second half of the uh, 19th century, German, Prussian, uh, like his father he died insane. Uh, Rob Hopkins, nihilism brings to mind despair and purposelessness and uh, the love of destruction. How far are these central to Nietzsche's ideas? They're central, though, not because not in the way that he supported those views in the end. He thought nihilism was a phenomenon of enormous cultural importance that had come marked the development of Western civilization at a certain crucial point, but he thought it was a form of sickness, reflecting deep, powerful pressures within Western society. That, and he thought, in the end, this sickness had to be overcome. So his main goal was to try and understand what nihilism was, which was, as you say, the scepticism about morality having any justification, coupled to the thought that life itself has no meaning except any meaning we can give it, coupled to the idea that despair or some kind of abandonment of morality and values is the right reaction to have to those ideas. Nietzsche accepted a lot of that, but thought in the end you had to do something better. You had to find some more positive response to the thoughts that nihilism embodied. He's generally regarded as somebody almost entirely destructive. You've mentioned the word positive. Can you tell us why you're bringing that in this early on? Because Nietzsche thought of attitudes to um, big ideas of major cultural movements as essentially either life-affirming or life-denying. For him, Christianity was life-denying. It valued another world, the world of the eternal, over this world. It valued asceticism, denial of the self, over letting the self run free. It tried to destroy the forces he thought were most natural and valuable in human life, so it was life-denying. Likewise, in the end, he thinks science and the enlightenment desire to know everything is, in a strange way, life-denying. And he thought if his philosophy Why has... Why did a... you think that was a desire to know everything was life-denying? Well, this is where things get a little complex. Ordinary it's... people would think that was, well, certainly not life-denying. That's right, but Nietzsche thought it's partly because science is the heir of Christian rigour and honesty. And Nietzsche thinks that life is essentially deceitful, so that those who seek truth at any price are going against the values that life embodies for Nietzsche. I see. Raymond Tallis, in The Will to Power, Nietzsche wrote, quote, The highest values devalue themselves, the aim is lacking, and why finds no answer. What were these highest values he was talking about, and what does he mean by the highest values devalue themselves? I think he's talking about two sorts of values. The values of renunciation that Rob has just referred to, those are Christian values, and also the value of the pursuit of disinterested truth, which had been characteristically the philosophical value, throughout, or the value that had informed philosophical inquiry over the years. I think Rob's made a very good attempt to try and show Nietzsche as coherent, or indeed consistent, but actually Nietzsche's, most of Nietzsche's views are profoundly incoherent. Um, the thing is, why has he been so attractive, and why has he attracted so many different people? And it's interesting that his incoherence is reflected in the very disparate sorts of people to whom he's appe appealed. I mean, what philosopher could uh, be cited as an influence on George Bernard Shaw, Michel Foucault, Jack Kerouac, and so on? Clearly somebody whose views are very difficult to pin down. I mean, my own feeling about Nietzsche is that he's a bit like a Rorschach inkblot. You can read out of him what you put into him. But return to the theme of his incoherence, his whole attitude to the revaluation of all values uh, was profoundly incoherent, because he wasn't just throwing away highest values or extreme values, uh, he was also throwing away bourgeois values, uh, the ordinary values of decency and so on, and he'd hoped that, having created a sort of post-atomic wasteland, that he would create a brand new set of values. And the question is, where were those values going to come from? Well, alas, all they can come from is from basic appetites and instincts, and that is really where Nietzsche has been a great inspiration to some of the most appalling things that happened in the century after his death. Well, we'll come, I'm sure Rob Hopkins will want to come back to that at the moment. Catherine Belsey, and 
nihilism as a term was first used in 1862 in uh, the Russian novel Fathers and Sons. Um, do you think it belongs more to fiction than to philosophy? I think it might. It, it, it's hard to imagine that there could really be somebody who subscribed to no values, no convictions, no commitments at all. It's hard to imagine the psychology of such a person, let alone the, the philosophical position. What would you have to say? The extraordinary thing is that in Fathers and Sons, the self-proclaimed nihilists are the sons who are reacting against the authority of their parents and the sympathy is with the nihilists but the nihilists turn out to be good enlightenment figures they're committed to science and knowledge the hero is a medic who in fact dies on account of contracting typhoid from a from doing a post-mortem in order to advance his knowledge of medicine so they're not in fact nihilists in the way that the word has come to be used what happened i think was that that w when the the notion had been created in fiction then small groups of people in russia began to call themselves nihilists for real do you think that nietzsche tried to live without illusions and if he did do you admire that I think I admire the refusal of dogma. I think you could see it in terms of a long tradition of a difference within Western philosophy, which would go right back to Plato and Socrates. Nietzsche's uh, resistance to Platonism, to the systematicity and dogmaticity of, of Platonism, uh, could be aligned with Socrates. Plato was, the, Plato was the great systematizer. He had theories about how things were. He knew about the ideas in the mind of God. And he also imagined a republic in which he knew how things ought to be arranged in a utopian state. Socrates, on the other hand, skeptical, doubtful, questioning, always interrogating people's certainties and convictions, pushing them further back. And, and I think you could see the whole history of Western philosophy in terms of that opposition between those two figures. The ironic thing is that it was Socrates who was executed, not Plato. And you might say that, that if we'd got things the other way around, less damage would have been done. To that degree, I'd be with Nietzsche. Rob, you've been sitting very quietly uh, after the full frontal attack by uh, Raymond Tallis on, 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 on Nietzsche. You've been behaving very well and not much of it has been pulled out. But would you like to respond to what he was saying? Yeah, well, there are lots of things in what Raymond said. It's true that there are many conflicting strands in Nietzsche. It's true that he revels in these to some extent. It's possible that he thought that, that he was deliberately setting out to present conflicting strands to, un to stress one of his own views, which is that if you just try and go for a nice, clean system, you end up with illusion. But I think, anyway, there are central strands in his thinking that can be reconciled one with another. And if you allow a bit for hyperbole and his devastating poetical twists and turns at various times and don't take them too literally, you get some kind of coherent body of thought. Is there a sense, Catherine Balzi, that Nietzsche tried to kill off the Enlightenment and the idea of progress which the Enlightenment carried? I think... The Enlightenment itself, curiously, was a form of scepticism. But once that had settled down and, and been accepted for 200 years, it needed a new challenge. This is, in a way, how philosophy works, isn't it? That it constantly challenges existing dogmas. So whereas, for example, Locke had challenged the... had secularized, I suppose, philosophy, had challenged the theocentric universe. So at the end of the 19th century, the time had come, perhaps, to query the idea that there were foundations, grounds that you could appeal to, which would deliver truth. So what the Enlightenment had offered in place of God was various secular foundations, the moral law or reason or the law of nature, laws of nature. And it seems to me that this will to truth that Nietzsche describes and deplores had maybe run its course in a way that made it necessary to rethink the basic questions again. And to that extent, it seems to me that what he's doing is far from sick, but is positively healthy. Can I say something here? The will to truth, in a way, if you just say the will to truth has run its course, it sounds mad. Truth is the obvious goal of all, in all inquiry. You can't just jettison it while continuing to inquire. So whatever Nietzsche meant by attacking the will to truth, it can't have just been the thought that there is something out there called truth which we might or might not want. If we're going to inquire at all, as the Enlightenment and anything post the Enlightenment suggests, you must aim your inquiries at something. That the name for that thing is truth. Well, it's not I'm, an optional extra in this respect. I'm, it's not so much, um, the, one of the problems is, is, is Nietzsche undermined the will to truth by seeing behind it the will to power, and in fact he was very influential in the 20th century suspicion towards the whole idea of disinterested inquiry. 
And the reason for this lies in another of his metaphysical world pictures, which is uh, in a... Uh, uh, it's written down in a small fragment, which I don't think he published in his life, called On Truth and Lie in an Extra Moral Sense. And he offers us a fable. He says, on a remote planet, there was once a clever animal that invented knowledge. The remote planet is Earth, the clever animal is human beings. But, of course, that knowledge wasn't about how things really were. That knowledge was a way of organising um, understanding of the universe to support the continuing life of that animal. The knowledge, if you like, was uh, a form of uh, adaptation to uh, ensure biological survival. This knowledge wasn't about truth. Truth, what seems to be truth, is actually all about survival and indeed the will to power. And that, again, is a very fundamental, very influential aspect of Nietzsche, which is incoherent because, of course, he's offered us a model of the relationship between the will to truth and the will to power, which we are expected to accept is objectively true or we reject it. Taking up the will to power, in the will to power, Nietzsche wrote, quote, every belief considering something true is necessarily false because there's simply no true world. Rob Hopkins, what's your reaction to that? When we talk about truth, we need to distinguish different things. We might be saying when we're saying that truth is, there's no truth, you might be saying there is no thing of a certain kind. There's no independent world. It's quite separate from our beliefs, which it can conform to. And in that sense, there's no truth. We might be saying that there is such a thing, but we can never grasp it. Or we might be saying there is such a thing and we could grasp it, but that shouldn't be the main dominant goal of our lives. I think Nietzsche was interested in all three of these ideas. I think Raymond's right that he did attack truth under the first respect. But notice that if you think there isn't truth in this sense of correspondence with a quite independently specifiable reality, it's still open to you to think that there is truth in another sense. Maybe it's the richness of the idea of truth that's the problem here, not the idea of truth itself. Except that he wove truth in power when he said that truth is a mobile army of metaphors. And truth is the customary metaphor, and the metaphor becomes customary when it is adhered to by the most powerful group in society. So he was very much an ancestor of Foucault and people like that in this respect. So although I entirely ex accept your differentiation of different aspects or strata of truth, I think Nietzsche undermined the foundations of all of those three, but presented his ideas themselves as truths and thus was incoherent. Catherine Bellotti. Rob says that, that the project of philosophy must be the pursuit of truth. Any project of inquiry. I'm very doubtful about whether we can have truth in any sense of the term that would be understood in ordinary language as meaning truth. It seems to me that there, there simply can be no certainty that the language in which we formulate truth matches the world about which we would tell the truth. And it seems to me that whereas I don't think Nietzsche theorizes that, a great deal of philosophy in the in the 20th century has been concerned with problematizing that notion that we can have the truth. So if that is the goal of all inquiry, it seems to me that it might be doomed. And I'd like to suggest that we might put our, our goals somewhere else, somewhere that we could hope to get to. But Nietzsche, in a way, I mean, he undermined even empirical truth, the famous response to the empiricists who said there are only facts. He said there are no such things as facts, there's only interpretations. And that could almost be a motto on uh, cultural studies um, departments in many of the new universities. But it seems to me that uh, he, by, by this means, he put himself in a very awkward position. I mean, I do believe in one or two empirical truths. I confess at this moment, I believe, for example, that I'm in London. I believe, for example, that the sun is 93 you know, million miles away from the earth. I believe there are some major scientific truths. So I have no trouble with empirical truth. Nietzsche did. Obviously, there are certain world picture type truths which are relativizable, but there are many non relativizable empirical truths, and Nietzsche didn't allow for that. It does depend, though, what we mean by truth, just to return to a traditional philosophical theme and a point I've made before. I needn't disagree with Catherine's last comment, I think, but I hear her saying if you make the notion of truth too substantial, then it becomes something unattainable. But there are other things we might mean by truth. For instance, philosophers have thought that what it is for a belief to be true might be just for it to cohere with the other beliefs in as large a possible a set of beliefs. Now, I'm not sure, Catherine, whether you're attacking that idea or not. In that sense of truth, do you think truth is unattainable? I would have thought, if that's what those philosophers mean, it would help, in a sense, not to call it truth. Because what most people understand by the term truth is correspondence. 
But is that true? Why Between think, the, why think the this, that's a particular metaphysical view? There's an indep- a world independent of our beliefs. There are beliefs, and the one corresponds to the other, and that's what it is for them to be true. That's already quite philosophically sophisticated. Now, it's not that everyday people aren't able to grasp those things, but they just don't ever have any thoughts about them. So why is that picture of truth written into our everyday truth talk? I think my problem is the word truth and, and the meaning in ordinary language of that term. If, if you're saying the goal of philosophical inquiry is something different, like coherence between ideas, let's call it that. Let's not call it truth, I'll because any to word call it truth like, is, is to mislead. I mean, there's clearly two modes of truth, very crudely, and, and this has come out of the conversation, there's co- co- coherence theory of truth and correspond- or correspondent type truths and coherent type truths. Correspondent truth is, a, for example, an assertion that really uh, is true because it corresponds to some state of affairs out there. A coherent form of truth is one that is, appears to be true because it coheres with other statements. The show with Nietzsche was that his uh, idea of truth and lie in the extra moral sense in a way, uh, made all truths um, vulnerable in the way that coherent truths are. That is to say, he, could, he, he didn't believe that there was any margin for realistic or correspondent types of truths. Can I take it just, not necessarily further, but in another direction? Socio was, uh, a, again, someone we assume was influenced by Nietzsche, and he talked about be, all of us being trapped within language. Uh, Catherine Belsi, what did he mean by that, and do you agree with it? Um, what I think Saussure argues is precisely that there is no evidence whatever that, that the language we use, the language we think in and philosophize in, of course, bears any relation to the world outside. What any relation? He, any relation. What he argues is that meaning depends not on correspondence to something out there, a thing in the world, or an idea in our heads. Meaning depends purely on difference. And he argues from the point of view of translation, that if there were things in the world which language named, or if there were ideas in our heads which language named, there would be no problem of translation, because the ideas would be similarly named in all languages, and you could translate easily from one to another. Now, we know, anybody who's ever tried to translate anything knows very well, that it's extremely difficult, because different languages name the world differently. They divide it into different parts. They differentiate differently. The British Empire could cope wonderfully with that. It just thought the natives had got it wrong, and we'd got it right, and we must tell them the truth. But I think multiculturalism has now taught us that it's not as simple as that. And therefore, we have a sense that different cultures perceive the world differently, name the world differently, and therefore we can't be certain what it is that's out there. Does it take us that far that quickly? I mean, the differences aren't all that great between English and French and uh, Italian. That's a good point. And we could even say what it is they don't have a word for. Yeah. We're talking about relativity of truth, in this case, to language. And I have to say that the misuse of Saussure was inspired by Nietzsche in the sense that people were dying to find evidences of relativities of truth or the way in which truth is relative. Yeah. And the common idea nowadays is that truths are relative to communities of discourse. Your language, in a sense, uh, determines to some extent uh, the kinds of truths that you're inclined to express. This is based, at least in part, on a very profound misreading of Saussure. What Saussure did was point out the fact that words don't have meaning in isolation. They have meanings only as a part of a system of meanings. Catherine mentioned differences. Words have meanings only in their opposition to other words. Like cat. Does that only have a difference in opposition? Well, exactly. To That's a good point. And, and I mean, I yes. can come to that and say... This was not a dog. Well, not so. Or a horse. But perhaps we can... Can, can I, I just... A cat is a cat without there being a dog around. Ah. <laughs> I think but supposing... <laughs> supposing there were to be a language which didn't have a word for cat... There are, in fact, languages that don't have a word for dog. If you ask, um, I think, a Japanese, the student will respond, what kind of dog do you mean when you ask what is the word in Japanese for dog? Do you mean the kind of dog but, you exhibit at a show for prizes? But these, do we you can mean, say that too, but we still know that. Uh, but we have one, one word. Dog is a dog they is have, we, they we, don't have one word. Let me give you another example. We don't have one this word for dog. For if I said to people who really know dogs, that's a dog, they'd say, that is not a dog, that's a cocker's manual. Let me Labrador. give you an example for real, Melvin. Uh, the Japanese translator of my book at the moment has emailed me to say, what kind of valley is the Rumney Valley that you refer to? Because I have to know 
which word I'm to use to translate this word valley. Is it a steep-sided valley or with a river at the bottom, or is it a broad... Well, it's easy to answer, and I, I suggest this is slightly marginal. But in terms it, of expression, the there's in terms no of word the basic valley, of speech being expression, if anybody puts their hand into a fire all over the world, they say sort of, ouch. That's well, actually, and what we're talking about is marginal things, and so you could even, ask, intel- so you can even ask intelligent questions about translation. If, if there was community discourse that was sealed off from each other, you couldn't even ask those kind of questions about translation. The misinterpretation of Saussure was to say that because words exist as part of a system, those words are sealed off from the outside world. They do not mean as things outside the system. And that, to me, is as daft as saying, if I use a language of pointing, and I point to objects, I use a, a special convention of pointing, then everything that I point to is a pointee. It doesn't belong to the real world. There's Absolutely. a perfectly sensible point here, embodied in Catherine's thinking, not that she's failing to make it herself, which is this, that... Uh, given that languages differ, given they carve up the world in different ways, we have to ask the following question. Is there a way the world comes carved up already, or is, it just, is the division just done by languages? So that our concepts, the way we distort, do we divide things and categorize them, are artifacts of language. If that's right, as it does seem right, then differences between language suggest there is no one way the world comes du- divided up. So you can still have the idea of a reality out there, but it begins to do increasingly little work in your philosophical picture of what's going on. And in particular, this is a useful strand, I think, in the attack on the correspondence theory of truth, with which we're both sympathetic. If you can't begin to get a handle on this reality to which things must correspond, then what role is it doing in your philosophical account of what truth is? Catherine Balzi, Baudrillard famously claimed that the Gulf War did not take place. Mm. Now, what point was he making there, and how do you see that as part of this argument about scepticism and truth? The title of that book is extraordinarily provocative, of course, because we all know that the Gulf War, or think we know, that the Gulf War did take place. What the point he's making is that we, we none of us have access to what that war really consisted of. That's to say, we who were not involved in it depend on the media to tell us. We depend on reports, which are in language, which might or might not be accurate. We depend on television pictures, which equally might or might not be trustworthy. Not not that people who hold cameras are lying deliberately, but, but pictures, stories are edited, they're told in a particular way according to a particular genre. But alternatively, you could have been there, but if you were there, you didn't see the whole thing. You saw your bit of the thing. Yeah, but couldn't he have called the book Nobody Knows Everything About the Gulf War, and that would be oh, fine. it wouldn't have been it, so nobody, provocative. Yeah, nobody wanted to be provocative. If you've explained what we did, but actually you've taken the piss of it away, because uh, he said that because he wanted to say something about truth. Now, what, in your opinion, was he saying about truth by using that title? I can explain it away, you can explain it away, but he didn't explain it away. He put that title and he put it down as a gauntlet. Now we have to pick it up. Yes. I think what he's saying is that we don't have... We, we imagine, because we see it on television, that we have access to the truth. And actually what we see on television is always constructed, is always produced by somebody yes, and from a point that. of view. Well, I think they do know that. And, and yeah, maybe the book is not the most important thing that happened. But there are uses to querying the notion that we know how things are. And maybe I could... Maybe I could say why I think this scepticism is important. All the people who've perpetrated those atrocities in the 20th century, uh, and I think of Stalinism and National Socialism and Maoism, all the people who've been responsible for those atrocities have known that they possessed the truth. They were certain that they knew what was best and what was right. It's hard to imagine sending anybody to a gas chamber in the name of scepticism. But can we return to Baudrillard and the Gulf War that's not supposed to have happened? I mean, his claim was more radical than the one that you're making, and that's why he sold his books. And basically he was saying that the Gulf War consisted solely of its media representations. There wasn't anything out there corresponding to the sum total of media representations. And that was sickening, because one knew how much suffering was associated with the Gulf War. And that's when your colleague, for example, Christopher Norris, suddenly realised the kind of nonsense that postmodernism was leading him to, and he wrote a book called Uncritical Theory, which was precisely uh, directed at Baudrillard for denying the existence of something that was really a matter of human suffering. Well, I we, think... We, what, and there's what a difference between the Gulf War not taking place and, let's say, the Siberian War of, you know, 1999, which certainly didn't take place. I think what you're doing, and probably what Chris Norris is doing too, is taking the title for the book. But if you read the book closely, it is a highly intelligent book, and it's making a point that I would take seriously. I, I think it's very easy to travesty the arguments of sceptics, but when we look at them closely, 
they very often have a case which is worth attending to. Skeptics assume we're dafter than we are. I mean, all the points the moment just made is that you know, we don't have the sum total of truth about events, but we can certainly get a fix on important truths about events. We all know that, actually. There are very few people who don't know that. And uh, it, as I say, Baudrillard made his reputation, and has many postmodernists, by making much more radical claims than the sensible scepticism about the way things are represented. It seems to me that you're resisting, actually, uh, saying how deeply this has bitten into disciplines, deeply this idea of being no sort of truth, all truth sort of relative. Uh, a scepticism, in a sense, has an honourable pedigree. I don't think that postmodernism has quite that sort of unassailable pedigree, do you? You're, you're making it seem as if they're just, it's just a straightforward continuation from Socrates to postmodernists, not a join. No, I don't want to suggest that at all. That, that would be crude. But it does seem to me that it is time to query yet again the foundations that Nietzsche was querying. It's a good idea to repeat that question in every generation. Which, question, which particular question? Because we've had quite a lot of questions here. Uh, the question about whether there are absolute moral grounds or um, grounds for belief in God or grounds for belief in the laws of nature or any of those foundational metaphysical things that people turn to to justify the truths that they subscribe to. Those are the grounds of the truths that they believe in. And I think we do need to query those because when, when we ask the question, what if we take those away? What am I left with? Then we have to work it out for ourselves. We no longer have authorities telling us what we ought to do and what we ought to think. We have to think it out from, from the basics ourselves. Raymond Tullis, why do you call the postmodernists enemies of hope? Because um, they really undermine the two planks of the Enlightenment. One is the commitment to, to reason uh, and the human agent as a major force in human affairs, and the other is the commitment to objective knowledge arising out of dis disinterested inquiry. Both those things are undermined by postmodernism. And without those two things, we have no model of any kind of progress. And so that's why I think see them as enemies of hope. Do you think having no model of any kind of progress, Canon Bells, is in itself a bad thing? I think it's a good thing, because it seems to me we then have to ask the question, do we want things to be different? If so, how? And if we do want them to be different, how do we bring that about? We have precisely no models to turn to. We have to work it out, and that seems to me healthy in any culture. Do you find anything, Rob, uh, Rob Hopkins, do you find anything in Nietzsche which gives grounds for the sort of optimism that Roman Tallis and Idea of Progress, which he holds on to very strongly in his writings? Yes, I think there are grounds for that. Nietzsche was keen to live without illusion, above all else. And surely any project of improvement through insight has to begin by stripping away falsehoods. So to that extent, Nietzsche was very much the heir of the Enlightenment rather than its opposition. Certainly he's been a major influence amongst uh, non-disciplines. In that sense, his influence, whether it's his fault or not, has been largely corrosive. And he's been contributed to the collapse of scholarship to some extent that's taken place in the humanities in the last quarter of the 20th century. Well, that's our last programme for the 20th <laughs> for the year 2000. So, a good ending. Thank you all very much and thank you for listening.